welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. I'm really excited you're here starting off your week with us because we have two guests that are going to be talking about their issues working with their nonprofit, advancing during a tough funding ecosystem. What does that look like for them? And we're going to get on with Christine Sakdalen and Miguel Valentin to talk about MVP. Welcome, you two. Thanks Hi, for, thank having for having us, us. Julia. We're really excited. I mean, we're excited to learn about your work and your nonprofit, but then we're going to drill down about how you all are navigating, you know, this time in in uh, philanthropic fundraising and 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 just the the challenges that an organization like yours has. Um, and so we're really excited to have you come on and, and talk about this and 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 hopefully give us some advice and wisdom um, that we can all use. You know, we get wisdom every day from our presenting sponsors and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episodes on Friday, just dedicated to fundraising and fundraisers as a profession. It's super cool. And then your part-time controller. These are the folks that join us day in and day out so we can have the nonprofit show. Okay, we have this amazing co-host panel, but I'm flying solo today. I'm Julia C. Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, but you've probably met our co-hosts. They come from across the country. They're incredibly diverse in the areas um, that they work in and the sectors that they serve within the nonprofit community. And it has been a joy to work with them day in and day out. Okay, Christine Sakdalen, CEO and co-founder of MVP, joined today by Miguel Valentin, the executive director. Let's start off, you two, and have you share with us what MVP is. Yeah, thanks for the question. And again, thanks for having us here, Julia. So I'll start off and I'll turn it over to Miguel. But MVP is a nonprofit organization uh, we founded it about four years ago, and it really focuses on young people of color. Uh, and our mission is to build diverse leaders for tomorrow. And when we originally started this nonprofit, we thought, wow, if we can help one young person, uh, help them with some practical advice, internship opportunities, help them to prepare for their future careers, help them to perform, you know, ultimately progress and prosper, you know, hopefully these young people, these young leaders that we would then develop would pay it forward. So that's really how it started. Uh, and my co-founders and I, Tina Chang and Serene Henyan, we said to ourselves, if we could only help one person, it would be all it would have been worth it. Wow. I love that. And, you know, uh, this is not a path that we hear off, we hear about often enough. Miguel, as executive director I mean, I got to say, holy moly, starting four years ago, the world was kind of crazy yeah. still in this, you know, global pandemic. We have um, civil, uh, civic, I'm going to say civic unrest, where we have a lot of um, mm -hmm. tough things going on across our communities. Talk to us about your experience with MVP yeah. and, and how you pulled along, got pulled along into this work. Yeah, so MVP, like you said, started four years ago, but I came on about two years. So I was lucky enough to have other people lay some of the groundwork uh, before me. Uh, so I was very fortunate in that. But you're right. I mean, we're in a turbulent time, you know, economically, mm -hmm. socially. Uh, so a nonprofit like this is so specific but needed uh, mm -hmm. during this time. And so I came on because uh, it was so um, unique to my own story and my own experience. Uh, just being a person uh, from a low-income home, first-generation college student, just looking for opportunity. Uh, and I was fortunate to have some older individuals that mentored me and helped me along the way. But a lot of people I knew um, didn't have that opportunity. And so mm -hmm. this was a chance for me to, to give to the next generation uh, something that I was fortunate to have and something that I know a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that's incredibly powerful. Christine, as you were coming up the ranks, did you have support or where did you find your guidance? You know, and that's a great question as well. Just like Miguel said, you know, I come from a, a background where both my parents were in professional uh, careers. You know, they, they were in corporate. They came up the ranks as well. 
And as an immigrant coming from the Philippines, going to school here in America, I was very fortunate that my parents knew what they were doing. They had mm -hmm. uh, the wits about them to give me advice and mentorship. And also in my career in pharmaceuticals, which I still today am in pharmaceuticals, I've always had wonderful uh, mentors and I've always had wonderful champions and advocates. But then mm -hmm. I also realized not a lot of people have that. And I've gone through so much in my own life and in my own career mm -hmm. to know that if you don't use and leverage your own unique voice, then you won't have any, right? And you won't be able to really manage through the tough times in corporate America. And that's one of the reasons why I thought this would be a good nonprofit to stand up because so many young people need this type of help and this type of support. Right. You know, it's, it's really interesting because it also just you can knock off so much time. If you can get just a little bit of help up front, I mean, you could literally save a decade in the trajectory of your mm -hmm. career, yes. and then you have more opportunity and you're not just always catching up. Um, it, it's so I, I applaud you and, and this understanding this, this, this space that we need to promote. Let's talk about your, your nonprofit work. And, and I'm gonna ask the heavy lift question, and that is, can you build a sustainable nonprofit? This is a question that we ask a lot of folks. Sometimes uh, we hear from certain organizations, they're like, you know, our, our mission, vision, and values are so good that it automatically connects us with donors and funders. And so we're, we're automatically sustainable. And then others are, are want to say it changes every week. It changes every quarter. We, we are always fighting this. What advice would you give or, or how do you see this within MVP? Yeah, so I'll start off and then Miguel can uh, talk to you about the day to day. I would say based on our mission and really our core purpose, it should be sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a shame if we didn't sustain this type of work because there's not a lot of organizations that really offer this practical advice and the practical work that is needed uh, so much and young people, right? And especially those in underserved communities. So I would say, yes, it should be sustainable. We right. want it to be sustainable. We're working towards so many things to make it sustainable. Mm -hmm. But I'm also going to be honest to say that it is not easy. No. Um, maybe maybe part of me thinks, you know, this isn't my full-time career. I mean, I have a full-time mm -hmm. career, but at the same time, I really think that if we have the right people, and we do, for example, in, in Miguel, you, we have to invest in the right leadership and the right people, the right infrastructure in order for this to be sustainable. But it is not easy. We're still making our way, figuring it out. Uh, and hopefully shows like this that promote this type of work can help us to get to that level where we're not worried about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So Miguel, you're in the hot seat because as the executive yeah. director, you're seeing this day in and day out the stress has yeah. got to be unbearable how do you cope with it <laughs> yeah and it's so funny because right now we're in the season of working on next year's budget and so numbers are in my face now so yeah i mean it's it's always going to be that way i don't think it's ever gonna cruise but for us i mean we really try our best to diversify the different uh, places we get that funding from it's not mm -hmm. just individual donors but it's those advocates and companies that have the matching donations it's our, our corporate partners that um, open up opportunities for young people to do internships there and then they also support us financially because they believe in diverse talent brings strength to these companies so and and also grant writing and things like that so i think just seeing the diversity of ways that we can collect that funding and bring that in and, and redirect those sources um the better so you know we just plan it day by day uh, recently, we did a fundraising event where we got to, to help young people network with professionals uh, that are in their field. And we had a, a fun time doing it. So even fundraising doesn't have to be uh, stressful, burdensome. Uh, we had a really fun time just getting people together and raising funds that way. It's not the way that we get the majority of our funds. But like I said, once you start piecing these things together, uh, then you can create something a little more sustainable. So if one resource dries up, you still have others to kind of lean into uh, and bolster. Right. Yeah. I've got to ask you this, Miguel. Um, did you realize when you took on this position of being an executive director 
that fundraising would become such a key piece of your life? I mean, I ask this question a lot of, of CEOs mm -hmm. and executive directors, and they always honestly say it was kind of a shock. You know, even that, even if they come into an organization that has like a development yeah. team or development department, yeah. they uh -huh. still uh -huh. engage in fundraising. What's been your experience? No, I, I fully expected it to be uh, to be completely <laughs> honest. Um, right. uh, because I've worked in the nonprofit field for almost ten years, I think. You know, I, when I was much younger, I thought, yeah, I work in the nonprofit, help people, um, and I guess funding just happens. And uh, I think back then, when I first started in the nonprofit world, it was a shock on how much funding is is a conversation to constantly be had. And um, but you know, you I guess you kind of get used to that that grind of this is how things get done. And as an executive director, it is my job to look behind the scenes and make sure things are running, and then to highlight people, our volunteers, you know, those that uh, really have those interactions with with students and other people to allow them to have fun and, and do the things that, you know, I get to have fun as well and, and interact with the people that I've served, um, but just allowing other people to do the fun stuff and then mm -hmm. I can do kind of the back end structure grind and, and that's okay because we need all these different kinds of people in every organization. And so it yeah. wasn't a shock to me um, coming into this role. It was a shock to me when I was much younger and, and the world, you know, you need funding. <laughs> you, need, yeah. you need funding for things that you want. And I was yeah. just I was going to add that when we brought Miguel in, we were very clear that the number one priority yeah. for us in order to sustain this organization was fundraising. Yes, there is a lot of work on the program development side, you know, building out the infrastructure for volunteers, et cetera. But fundraising is something that we are front and center on. Uh, and that's also true for our board members. Right. So it's not just about mm -hmm. Miguel. Uh, doing things on his own as co-founders, as the CEO and co and one of the co-founders, as well as our board members, we recognize that we have to be very, very specific and very clear on what are the expectations. We're a working board, right? And if you're not the roll up your sleeves kind of a, a board member, then maybe this isn't the right place for you. So we've been very clear with Miguel and, and board members alike uh, to make sure that, you know, we're uh, transparent about those expectations you know good for you because i feel like that is what you just said is is probably mm -hmm. one of the biggest chinks in the armor of any nonprofit is that lack of communication and strategy towards expectation mm -hmm. um and on my sense of it is christine and miguel love to get your feedback on this is that when we aren't clear and when we don't communicate about what the expectations are and then things don't go the way we think they should or that we planned for, it's very easy to disengage, right? Because nobody wants to be a part of a losing team. And so you just get board members that then don't show up for the meetings or they don't really participate or, you know, it's kind of like a subtle thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just so pervasive as, as it grows throughout an organization. Um, and so yeah. really tough. I mean, it's got to be hard, Miguel, to um, communicate some of these these aspects that you've been charged with as well. Is that could that be? Yeah. And, and I, I love the point that you just touched on how to keep people engaged in the mission. Mm -hmm. And you're right. People don't want to be on that losing team. One of the first things that I started doing in board meetings uh, was doing these student highlight stories. Um, I haven't done one in a little while. I think I try to incorporate something in these meetings with everyone that's a part of MVP to highlight the things that we are accomplishing because we can get so bogged down, so in the weeds about you know things that we need to accomplish that we don't take time to celebrate. And I think that's so important in every organization. But in these highlights, I was able to tell the student background story and then also what MVP was able to do for them, what that means for them for the rest of their lives. And for future generations, our nonprofit really has rippling effects. Um, you know, we're helping people launch their careers and they have their jobs for the very first time. They can make money, start a family, et cetera, et cetera. So we're so pivotal um, for a lot of people. And it's so good to stop and reflect and remember that. So I try to incorporate that here and there. I think that, you know, the other thing that I would add to that is the event, for example, that Miguel talked about just two weekends ago, even if that wasn't a big fundraising uh, source for us. I mean, we, we raised funds, but it wasn't massive. But to me, the momentum and the inspiration that you get from an event like that, it is so palpable. 
it is so significant, right? And you just get reminded, like Miguel said, of why we are doing this work, because it's not easy. You know, the other thing that Miguel does really well is, you know, for, for board meetings, you know, we also hold each other accountable. And part of what he suggested, for example, for next year is how do we show up with quarterly reports of how the board members are doing and what the expectations are? How do we renew that every year? So there is a charter renewal uh, where we're, again, we're reminded what the expectations are so that there is that accountability. I think that that piece of it is critical. So there is the transparency of expectations, but also making sure that we're holding people accountable. I think those two is a winning combination. Right. Not to promote myself too hard, but I'm going to grab my book. I have a new book called Building Board Champion. I am going to send, I'm going to send this to both of you because... <laughs> You Thank know, you. It, it's really an interesting um, quandary. Mm. And yet, if you don't have that connection to the, the mission, mm. um, everything else really can't move forward. So I, I, I appreciate you looking at this. And, and you know, Miguel, um, what Christine was saying is so interesting because a lot of times when you look at an event, we will use the word friend raising instead of fundraising. Mm. You know, it's friend raising. It's like that. it may not come up with the cash right now but it's going to have some impact that we can track yeah. through and uh so good for you for keep you know keep moving forward on that you know i do want to talk about this um this tough funding climate and i love that you had the diversity miguel what have you seen and what have you been changing when you think about the, the challenges with fundraising and i would add it's really hard for a new nonprofit to fundraise a lot of times they'll be like we'll come back to us you know after five years mm -hmm. or you know so what did, what is it that you've been doing yeah we definitely got some of that too uh mm -hmm. where it come back to us in five that's so yeah. common um, and I think Christine is better to talk about how she started the nonprofit and how she got the funding to start the nonprofit. Like I said, I wasn't there. Um, and then I guess I could talk a little more about how we pivoted as the climate changed. Okay, great. Well, Christine, we're going to throw it back to yeah, you then. So, for sure, for sure. So in the beginning, uh, it really was going to people that we knew, right? It's the people mm -hmm. that we knew would also align to the mission that we had. Uh, so that's where we started. And quite frankly, we went to people that I also personally helped in their own mm -hmm. careers and their own business. So it's a way for them to pay it forward, right? Not to me, but to the community. Right. So that was where mm -hmm. it was so, so interesting in the beginning, not to make it say, seem that it was easy. It wasn't. Um, I'm not a fundraiser, you know, but, but here's the thing, right? If you believe in something, which I do in this work, then you don't make it about you right? Even if it's you that is asking for the money, you make it about the mission. You make it about the people that you are uh, impacting. You make it about the legacy that you want to leave out there in the world. And that's what made it easy for us. Easier, I would say, because it wasn't easy. So we started with those people. And then we went to some of the smaller organizations, again, who we thought would align with us. And then we pivoted, like Miguel said, where we went to the larger organizations. We leveraged the matching uh, program, the, the, or the matching gifts uh, program that large organizations have. have. Uh, we are just starting the grant writing process. Uh, and again, Miguel, Miguel can talk a little bit more about that, but that's how we started. You know, We started with people that we knew, that we trusted, mm -hmm. and that aligned with the mission that we have. I love that. Now, Miguel, you're, you're yeah. working through this organization trying mm -hmm. to get the work done, trying to achieve mission, fundraising, and now you're moving into the grant application space. Talk to us about that because that's not easy either. No, no, it's not. Um, and like Christine said, I mean, every organization is gonna realize that sometimes donors experience fatigue, that donor yeah. fatigue, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the partners that were in the beginning, sometimes it's hard to sustain the same people giving the same amount or more, uh, and so for us, we, like you said, she said that we had to pivot um, in different ways and start adding different things. So the talent pipeline program is a great example of how we pivoted. We were able to partner with companies to open up internships, to help students create a framework, do the recruitment for them and the training. 
uh, and then also receive donations from them in return. So this was a win-win for every single person involved. And that allowed us to raise funds at a, a much quicker pace. And so that program has been growing over the past three years. We're still looking for more host companies that are willing to open up their doors to internships. Um, but that's been a great way to pivot. In grant writing, I mean, it's it's a lot of reading, it's a lot of writing, it's a lot, it's a lot of uh, time searching um, through different rabbit holes, and that can be difficult. Um, but you know, even then, we have uh, some students that were willing to intern with us and, and work with us uh, that are really good at research, and they wanted the opportunity to showcase their work and, and give back uh, to the organization. So we've even had some of the students come and do some grant research for us, uh, which was a, a big lift on our part. Um, and then we can do the application and start to see where that goes. But yeah, just utilizing every resource that, that we have. Yeah. It's such an interesting thing to, to hear you talk about this and to pull back your, if you will, your clients and those that you serve into the process. Because I've got to believe that you are going to uh, take those people along the journey of success. And then like Christine said, you know, going back to people that you'd, you'd already helped, they could say, yeah, I benefited from this. Then they become part of that sustainable funding. I mean, they, they come back and, and want to support the support that they had. Right. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a magical thing. You know, and part of what I also think about, right, is yes, you have your friends and your family, your close, uh, close knit of, of um, friends and family that you can also go to, but the other thing that we've learned is we have to also diversify the industries that we go to for fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, when we first started, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm in, in the healthcare pharmaceutical world. Uh, so is the other founder. And so we naturally gravitated towards companies that we work with, right? And that we know. And so now part of the pivot that we're also uh, working through is what are the other industries, financial, technology, what are those industries that we need to go into? And part of that is also looking at uh, refreshing our board members who may have different kinds of connections, right? right? So just as we're teaching these young people in underserved communities about networking, we also have to do the same, right? Because right. networking will uh, result in, you know, just a proliferation of our own connections, ultimately the funding that we need. Yeah, it's it's very interesting because you're right. I mean, uh, Miguel, you started off at the top of the hour, or I should say the bottom of the hour, this conversation about how you were diversifying, you know, your, your income stream, your revenue streams and, and what that would look like so that you could be more stable and safe um, there's nothing worse than having that big funder and then they pull out and then you're just, you know, devastated. Um, so I, I love that, Christine, tying that back to board direction and board um, diversity as well. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, but I, I'm last but not least, I want to ask you about navigating through tough times and growth. How often do the two of you and your co-founder um, talk with Miguel? How do you bolster one another up do you how do you navigate this i mean because it can be really devastating to feel like you're not successful and then it just kind of things fall apart how do you keep going i'll start maybe turn it over to miguel so we have have uh, monthly meetings with miguel so the co-founders uh, that core leadership team we have monthly meetings with miguel and personally, I know he has one-on-ones with board members, one-on-ones with uh, the co-founders. Uh, he and I have, you know, regular informal touch points. You know, I, I want to always make sure that uh, he's, you know, he is supported, that he feels motivated. It's very difficult, right? It's a sometimes a nonprofit. It could be quite lonely. Yes. It could be isolating. Uh, but we want to make sure that Miguel is supported. And we're, you know, for for me personally, I'm always asking him are you still enjoying this work or how are you doing? Right. Because that's important because if you don't enjoy it, then, then it's going to show up in, you know, all kinds of ways. Yeah. Miguel, how do you feel about that? Yeah. yeah I, you know, Christine is absolutely right. I think a lot of the board members and people involved with MP has been, so, have been so good at um, making sure that we're on the right track, that we're still motivated to continue the mission. 
Um, and it can be, you know, honestly difficult sometimes when you're in, in it and you're, you're wishing that you could do more, that it was bigger, that you could help more students, you can make more connections. Um, but I think it's so good to step back and have these reflective conversations. Like we have these quarterly uh, reports that we, we pour over together uh, that we highlight some of the accomplishments we've done in the past three months. We do this yearly uh, reflection and they also, um, you know, they, they just do a really good job uh, of pouring into me as I continue to pour out to other people mm -hmm. and all, all the rest of our staff. Mm -hmm. How do but you- we can always be better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to ask along those same lines, Miguel, what do you do for self-care or to navigate through tough days so that you come back and you're, you're refreshed and, and you're, you're not, um, you, you can work at a higher level as opposed to, to coping at a lower level. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I do lean on the people that I, I work with a lot. Um, we have, staff on board that I'm able to have conversations with and see the work through their perspective and their eyes. But then also the students, you know, when I finish the summer internships with these students and they get to reflect on the time that they've had, um, you know, they're, they're just so grateful uh, for the work that we've done and the conversations that they have had with me along the way, the one-on-ones that I give them that um, it definitely does uh, keep me motivated and waking up in the morning and thinking that my work is meaningful. You know, it's not mundane at all, um, but it has impact and purpose. And so that, that helps me going. Um, but it's also, yeah, taking time to rest, taking time yeah. to reflect, I think is super important. I'm an avid, uh, journal, journaler, journalist, oh. journal, <laughs> journal <laughs> often. And, uh, and I think, yeah, mental, <laughs> mental health is, is just so good to be able to reflect, pause, breathe. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think everyone should should really make that a part of their regular regular day, week, month. Right. You know, when I talk with successful um, CEOs and executive directors of nonprofits, I love asking that question because I find it I find it two two things. One, it's age uh, related. Mm -hmm. Younger leaders tend to embrace this and see it as a strength and not a weakness. Mm -hmm. And then older leaders tend to see it as a weakness mm -hmm. and don't want to talk about it. Don't, you know, like, oh, I'm fine. You know, I just need to play golf on Sunday or, or whatever. I mean, they, <laughs> they kind of uh, kick the can down the road. And, and so I'm, I'm fascinated mm -hmm. by, by that ecosystem for, for leadership. Um, I've got to believe that this is an issue for, the students uh, that you work with as well moving forward in their careers absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah the burnout is is extremely common especially for the young generation that are trying to finish college and then especially the students that we work with that also work full-time or they're doing multiple things to support themselves their family members and they're also trying to think about their career and where they're going to go next and how are they going to pay for the student loans that they've taken out? Uh, and so it's a very serious thing for them. And, and it's hard for them to pause and reflect and take time uh, to care for themselves. So yeah, this comes up in conversation a lot. And, and I need to know, I need to make sure that I'm taking care of myself so that when I give advice to them for them to take care of themselves, right. they'll see that it's genuine, it's authentic. It's, mm -hmm. it's coming from a place of experience that yes, burnout can happen to everyone. It is not a weakness. Um, and you do just like on an airplane, you need to put the, the oxygen mask on your face first mm -hmm. before you can help the person next to you or else mm -hmm. you're going to end up passed out. So you need to take care of yourself as a leader and, and you know, in order to take care of everyone else. Yeah. yeah. I love no, it. I'm, I'm a big believer in that. And in, in fact, my, uh, my career in the pharmaceutical uh, industry uh, lead, I, I lead a mental health organization for a company. Um, so it is so critical for, for me as a human being, but also for the team that I lead in this company, uh, but also for the students, right, that we serve in MVP and also for Miguel. Um, it's mm -hmm. so, so critical. When you said that, that age difference, I, you know, I, I laughed a little bit because I'm, I must be so young that I'm all about, uh, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. That. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you know, I think that this conversation has been fascinating and, and it's been rooted in the concept of sustainability, mm -hmm. you know, championing something moving forward and as a new organization. It seems to me like you have so many great parts that are all moving in the right direction. And and I portend great things for your, your mission and moving forward. It's been a joy to have you both on so that we could learn more about you and then also get your perspective about the realities of running a nonprofit. Um, Christine Sackdallen, CEO and one of the co-founders of MVP. You can learn more about MVP and their work at mvpoc.org mvpoc.org and then you'll get to learn about what they're doing and, and maybe how you can get involved. Miguel Valentin, Executive Director Extraordinaire of MVP. Thank you, sir, for your work. I know it's not easy, but it is really important and uh, it's been a pleasure to get you on with a co-founder. We don't always get that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we get the EDs on or we get the co-founders on, but to have you both together has really been a joy and, and really a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. Yep. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, we want to make sure that we express our gratitude to our amazing sponsors before we sign off today. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that really support us. And we done nearly 1200 episodes now five years so um it's it's these folks that really stand behind us and allow us to do this work you know as we end each and every episode we sign off with this mantra and it's simple but it's very complex at the same time and it goes like this to stay well so you can do well thanks everyone <laughs>